Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 18th of June and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 21st of June with me Michael Hewson. It's certainly been an interesting week. Uh, the Federal Reserve certainly I think threw a little bit of a fly in the ointment of the markets um, thinking about uh, the timing or otherwise of potential rate rises but ultimately really should it have done i mean when you think about what the data has been doing concerns about higher than expected inflation should we really be surprised that the federal reserve is maybe concerned that some of the price pressures that we're seeing in some of the headline numbers ppi cpi are slightly slightly hotter than expected I don't think we should um, and I think there was an awful lot of complacency um, amongst market participants about um, the Fed's attitude towards price pressures let's face it when you when, you know when we when we sit down and think about what's happened over the course of the past 15 months can anyone anywhere say with any degree of certainty how the recovery is likely to play out we are still seeing significant disruptions to supply chains we're still seeing significant base effects as well and we are seeing some significant rises in commodity prices so i think it's entirely credible for the Federal Reserve to be a little bit cautious and start to hedge their bets a little bit. Um, but certainly I think in the context of the data that we've seen thus far, the inflation numbers continue to look a little bit hot. Yes, we have seen a little bit of a slowdown in the US labor market, but that was only on basis of um, preconceptions in March that we would be adding jobs back of around 1 million a month. Now we know that is not going to happen, but nonetheless, we are still seeing some fairly decent jobs growth, albeit at a lower baseline than was originally envisaged at the end of the first quarter. You know, I, th I don't think, I think it's important not to underestimate the fact that an awful lot of fiscal support is still in place some us states are now starting to withdraw this extra unemployment insurance and as such um, when you look at the number of vacancies that are available in the us economy around about 9 million and the fact that um, us unemployment um, is still higher than it was pre-pandemic and there are seven and a half million people um fewer people in the US workforce than was the case pre-pandemic and yet nine million vacancies that would suggest to me that some people have dropped out of the workforce completely either they've retired um, or they're unable to work as of yet or ultimately they're not signing on for unemployment benefit because they don't see the need to because they're still living off the fiscal support from three big stimulus packages over the course of the past 12 months so I'm not overly concerned about um, a slower pace of jobs growth. It should continue to remain fairly steady as the support packages, the fiscal support packages drift away. But one thing that I would take away from this week's Fed shift, and it wasn't really much of a shift. I mean, let's face it. I mean, the Federal Reserve is talking about the prospect that we might see two rate hikes by the end of 2023. The bond buying program of $120 billion a month is still in place. And they've, they've increased the uh, rate on excess reserves by five basis points to not from 0.1 to 0.15%. It's hardly what you might call a taper tantrum. Um, and yet to see the way that the, the bond market reacted, you'd think the, the sky had fallen in. And it wasn't there for a subsequent surprise to see the bond market yield, the yields that we saw, the yield spike that we saw Wednesday night, Thursday, um, reverse quite quickly. The Federal Reserve still remains a long, long way 
from raising rates back to the levels that they were at the beginning of 2020. Um, so we are still very much in emergency rate cut territory and we are still seeing a significant um, amount of fiscal stimulus, oh, sorry, monetary stimulus being chucked into the US economy. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't get a taper. We probably will. We'll probably get it by um, the fourth quarter of this year. And ultimately, if the recovery goes as expected, you would expect that to happen anyway. So for me, I think the market um, and investors in particular probably need to get a grip. Um, nonetheless, we've seen a little bit of weakness in the latter part of the week for equity markets. And none of that you know, most of that has been really highlighted by the slide lower in the FTSE 100, largely as a result of a big sell-off in commodity prices, um, which have, I think, been hit a little bit on the fact that the dollar is a little bit stronger, but also um, they've been coming off their May peaks for quite some time now. And all this talk of a commodity super cycle, you know, while it sounds great and in principle and, you know, means that an awful lot of people click on headlines. You know, super cycles take place over 15, 20, 25, 30 years. To be quite honest, I struggle to figure out where commodities are going to be next week, let alone next in the next in the next year or the next five years. Um, but what I what I have seen is evidence that commodity prices have peaked in the short term. We've certainly seen it in the face of the lumber market, which I um, which I may have pointed out in a video uh, on, in a video quite recently, but we've also seen um, significant drops in the prices of corn, wheat, soy, um, uh, and sugar. So that in itself should allay some concerns about persistent inflation and would suggest that what we're seeing at the moment, oil prices notwithstanding, of course, that an awful lot of what we're seeing is transitory. I'm not going to say that all of it is because that would be patently untrue. But certainly on the basis of what we've seen in the past couple of days, the decline in precious metals prices and basic resources, what have you, is hitting the FTSE quite hard. But what it's not doing is not changing the overall direction of travel when it comes to the slow move higher that we've seen since the February lows. And that's all we can ultimately ultimately go on. You know, we're still in an uptrend. We're still making higher highs. We're still making higher lows. And until such times as we break the 50-day moving average or this trend line here, I would prefer the 50-day moving average, then the line of least resistance is for a move higher. Now, this week we have made new record highs on the DAX. So again, the direction of travel is quite clear. Um, another trend line, another 50-day moving average. So once again, we, we remain very much in by the dip territory, despite some of the softness that we've seen in the past um, 24 hours. Uh, as I say, we, we saw a new record high this week on the DAX. We've seen one on the Euro stocks 50, and we've also seen it in the stock 600. Ultimately, European stocks still continue to look fairly well supported simply because if the, even if the Federal Reserve is mapping out a path for a potential tightening of monetary policy, European Central Bank isn't anywhere near close and is not likely to be. And despite all of the misgivings that we're hearing from some of the more hawkish members of the um, governing council, it's going to be a very, very tough ask for the ECB to even contemplate um, a tightening of monetary policy. And that is why the dollar's rebound has been so significant. Um, and ultimately, it could actually give the ECB a little bit of room um, in the longer term to potentially, certainly not tighten monetary policy, but certainly for it not to be as loose as it currently is. The drop in the euro has certainly helped in that regard. It takes some of the deflationary effects of a higher euro off and help the boost underlying inflation number, which still in Europe remains well below the ECB's 2% target. Um, it's a different ball game if you're talking about the UK, where inflation has finally moved above the Bank of England's 2% target. And 
that that neatly segues me in to what's coming up this coming week because we've got the Bank of England due to meet on the 24th of June and that's likely to be an interesting meeting. Um, we've also got US PCE which is the Federal Reserve's preferred inflation indicator and I'll talk a little bit about that um, after I've talked about the Bank of England and we've also got US personal spending and income for May as well. We've also got flash PMIs, um, not really expecting too many surprises from those for June, flash PMIs for June from the UK, France and Germany. And we've got a number of earnings announcements from the likes of Nike, FedEx, Packaging Company, DS Smith and Barclay Group, um, UK house builder Barclay Group. May not have time for all of them, but there's certainly um, something to keep an eye out for. Um, so we've talked about the, the FTSE 100, we've talked about um, the DAX. Let's quickly just cover the S&P 500 before we move on to the Bank of England. But as you can see, direction of travel still remains fairly similar. Made another record high on the S&P 500 uh, this week. So even though we have seen a little bit of weakness towards the back end of uh, the week, uh, the direction of travel still remains um, fairly decent. This is obviously Friday, this is obviously Thursday's post FOMC decline. Seen a little bit of a rebound, and we're pretty much flat um, today with the US off for a government holiday. So S&P 500 there, and we've also got the Nasdaq, which has continued to look very well supported um, as US Treasury yields trade back below 1.5%. So one one of the one of the um, initial knee-jerk reactions for the change of policy on Wednesday was the U.S. 10-year jumped from 148 almost to shy of 160, and now it's back below 150 again. Um, and consequently, that's seen the Nasdaq um, move back up. Ultimately, higher bond yields, higher long-term bond yields tend to act as a little bit of drag on the heart, more highly valued parts of the US stock market. Um, it's a little bit of a seesaw effect, but the fact that US Treasury yields, 10-year Treasury yields have fallen back 1.5%, 1, 1. make the tech sector slightly more attractive from a growth point of view. Anyway, um, talk about the Bank of England, because Pound hasn't had a particularly great last couple of days. Um, which is a little bit strange given some of the data that we've seen out this week. But I think what's really upset the Apple cart today, um, I need to redraw this channel, so I think I'll do that now, is that we have been bumping against the upper part of this channel for quite some time. That's the thing with, with channels and trend lines. Sometimes you need to redraw them or tweak them ever so slightly, you know, as a broad as a broad range, they can, they're still fairly reliable, but sometimes they need to be recrafted, which is basically what I've done here. Now you can call it curve fitting if you like. Um, it's not really because we didn't really break too much above it and it just makes it look a little bit neater. I could easily probably put it through that peak there or that peak there. Um, and that would then mean that you've got a little few little, little in, intraday penetrations to that. But overall, the direction of travel is the pound is bumping up against the upper end of its ranges. It's starting to trend a little bit lower. And next week's Bank of England meeting um, could well give the pound an additional nudge one way or the other. And I think one of the reasons, obviously, we've seen weakness today, Friday, is because of a rather disappointing May retail sales number, which um, missed expectations by a surprise factor of nearly 3%. We were expecting a rise of 1.5% and we got a contraction of 1.4%. But we also need to put that 1.4% decline in perspective. It's coming off the back of three successive monthly rises, the last two months of which were 5.4 and 9.2. So 5.4 in March, 9.2% in April. So even on the quarter, we're still around about 7.7% up. Um, so we're still seeing a fairly decent decline. And while the numbers were pretty ropey, 
you know, even I have to admit that the May weather, the beginning of May weather was also pretty ropey as well. And that may have tempered a little bit of consumer demand at the beginning of the month. At the end of the month, we had half term and we could well, see, we could well have seen a significant uptick in uh, consumer or, or consumption towards the end of the month. And that could prompt a slight upward revision when the June numbers are released. Now, obviously, we've seen a delay to um, the ending of lockdown restrictions as well. Some people are um, musing that what that could be another reason behind the pound's decline, as well as the fact that the Conservatives lost a very, very safe seat overnight of Chesham and Amersham by quite by by quite some distance, and. An awful lot of people are saying, oh, you know, this could mark a paradigm shift in politics, which is slightly over-egging the narrative a little bit. Yes, the Tories got a bit of a thumping, but in the overall scheme of things, does it alter that much? For me, the Tories have an 80-seat majority, so if I was a voter and I wasn't particularly happy with the government, I wouldn't have any compunction whatsoever in voting for the Lib Dems because it's a fairly low-risk strategy. You just reduce their majority. Um, you know, by, by a couple of, you know, by a factor of two. Um, so, you know, to hear some of the narrative coming out of the newspapers, you know, that it's the end of the world, to quite, in, you know, in all honesty, is, you know, it, it's not really credible and it's certainly not going to, it's certainly not going to have a significant effect on the value of the pound. Um, you know, ask me that question at a general election when the outcome is nowhere near as cut and dried and then see how confident people are about um, voting for the Lib Dems or for Labour for that matter. You know, so for me, it's about context. And at the moment, the context with this by-election, you know, with the Tories with the seat, with the, with the majority that they have, you know, it's really, it's a fairly low risk strategy. Having said that, there's no arguing with the fact that cable is down four, five, six days in a row. So you, you can't argue with that. And we're testing that trend line support for, from the lows that we saw all the way back in September last year. So there is a risk that we could be starting to break down. And obviously that 140 level was a very, very key chart point. Um, so the big question now is whether or not we go back and retest 138. I'm still minded to think that next week the Bank of England will be forced to confront the fact that the UK economy, despite the weak retail sales numbers for May, is still doing OK. And at the last meeting, what was particularly notable was the bank's decision to announce it was reducing the amount of bonds it was buying on a weekly basis to $3.4 billion. It also raised its annual GDP forecast to $7.4 Five percent. Now, and we all know that Governor Bailey at the time suggested that the reduction on the bond buying program was an operational decision, in inverted commas. But for me, it still marks it's the same thing. It's it's a form of taper. It's a, a form of reducing the amount of bonds that you buy on a weekly basis, and that would be entirely in line with an improving economic outlook and a much more optimistic outlook, even with the exten extension of some restrictions into July. Um, you know, the Fed has given the Bank of England room to basically give a much more optimistic outlook for the UK economy. Now, obviously, this assumes that there aren't any virus variant setbacks. And yes, infection rates are going up. But the key thing for me will be not so much infection rates, but hospitalization rates and death rates. And if they continue to remain fairly low, then I think it's highly likely that the economic data will show a continued improvement as we head into Q3. So it's also important to note that it's Andy Haldane's last meeting as chief economist, and he's become an awful lot more free with his opinions over the course of the past few weeks. And I think, it, you know, even, even though the rest of the FO, even if the rest of the FOMC, even if the rest of the MPC, the Monetary Policy Committee, is probably more dovish than hawkish, ultimately they have to go with the data. 
and the data is pointing to an economic improvement. And, you know, Haldane's comments that the recovery is going gang gangbusters, it's likely to mean that the Bank of England will be, I think, an awful lot more positive about the outlook and potentially follow the Fed in outlining a potential or hinting at a potential outline of a tapering of its bond or its asset purchase program, particularly now that CPI inflation is above the Bank of England target of 2% and set to move even higher if the recent moves higher in PPI are any guide. So I think for me, there is potential for further sterling weakness back to around about 138. I would be concerned if we drop much below that, but the big, big level on cable is this level back down here at 136.70. So, you know, stronger dollar could drive it down to that sort of area. But overall, I'm not of the opinion that the pound is about to fall out of bed at this moment in time. And that can be shown by the fact that euro sterling still remains very much range bound, solid floor around about 85.40, 85.50, with various levels of resistance, 86.40, 86.70, and 87.30. So still very much sell the rallies on euro sterling. I see no reason to be bearish on sterling at this point in time, certainly not on the basis of the charts that we're seeing right now. Now, we're also seeing US PCE. Um, and I think amidst all of the concern about rising inflation, the fact that the Fed has shifted monetary policy um, somewhat in the past few days, will probably make this PCE number less important than it would have been otherwise. Um, nonetheless, expectations are for a sharp rise to 4%, which if it happens will be the highest level since the early 1990s. Core PCE deflator is expected to see a similarly sharp increase from 3.1 to 3.5%. So what does this mean for the dollar index? Well, we've seen a big breakout in that. We can see that in this chart here. The key level now on this particular chart will be the 200 day moving average now that we've broken above this trend line here and also this series of peaks through here. So we are approaching, if I think, a fairly key level on the dollar index. We could well see further gains in the short to medium term, but we could run into a little bit of resistance um, as we head towards 960 and the 200 day moving average. And that should well limit the downside when it comes to for example, cable and to a lesser extent, euro dollar. Same sort of thing with euro dollar. I think we've seen a much more bearish breakout here. We've broken not only the 50 day moving average, but the 200 day moving average. And that would suggest that we could well see further losses back towards 118.70. Uh, but again, here you could find a little bit of support in and around this sort of this low here and this low here. There is a little bit of what I call stickiness in the bid where if euro dollar drops down to around about 118 and a half that could prompt a little bit of a rebound but nonetheless you know looking at this chart and i think it's the bias remains very much for euro dollar selling the rally um, we also saw a big decline in gold um, as a consequence of um, this week's decision by the fed what was interesting though was that we bounced off this 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level of this move up from the lows around about 16.72 to the peaks at 19.16. So this is a big level here, 17.68. We've respected it so far. Also happens to coincide with this series of lows through here. So in that context, it's quite important. So while we could see a little bit of a rebound if US yields continue to fall back, you need to be cognizant of the fact that we could see a little bit of resistance around 1800 which was also the 50% retracement. And if you look at these peaks here, 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 and here, um, you could see a little bit of resistance in the short term there as well. So certainly keep an eye on gold prices and commodity prices in general, because we have started to see a little bit of weakness there. And that could be another reason why you're getting a little bit of softening in bond yields, because the narrative could be, well, actually, maybe an awful lot of what we're seeing in terms of inflation is transitory now that commodity prices are starting to slow down somewhat. We've also got US bank stress test results due out on the 24th of June. We've seen this week a couple of profit warnings or revenue warnings from the likes of JP Morgan and Citigroup. Um, these, these stress test results are important 
in the context of payouts. Um, the Federal Reserve could actually open the door um, to um, dropping all restrictions on shareholder payouts for US banks in the medium term. June the 30, we'll see all banks that pass these stress tests, we'll see all of these restrictions lifted. So the 24th of June should be interesting, particularly given the fact that um, JP Morgan and Citigroup have both warned that revenues in Q2 are likely to be um, well below expectations and well below the levels that we saw in Q1. Um, and on that note, I actually might have a quick look at a share price for JP Morgan Chase. Let's just quickly open our banks. Uh, let's just quickly open our banks um, watch list, and then we can find a JP Morgan. I can actually see it. There we go. So we can see the extent of that down move there. Um, you know, and obviously there is potential for further downside with support around about these sorts of levels here. So this looks quite an interesting chart for JP Morgan. Is this, um, uh, this is, this is, this is, this is a weekly chart. So obviously two successive down weeks, the, the impulsive move lower is quite strong there. You can see it an awful lot better there. So be paying particular attention to this 145 area, 146, 145, um, in the context of the declines that we've seen over the course of the past couple of weeks. Um, quickly, just cover, we got flash PMIs on the 23rd of June um, from the UK and Germany. They'll give us a decent indication as to whether or not the economic reopening, particularly in the UK, um, is able to sustain the momentum that we saw in March and April. And obviously that could also be another factor, potentially helping to arrest some of the sterling weakness that we've seen in the past couple of days. Um, I say the May services PMI has painted a robust picture. They hit a 24-year high at 62.9. Manufacturing rose to 65.6, a record high. You'd have to struggle to make the case for them to maintain that sort of hot streak. But nonetheless, um, I think it will be a positive if they continue to come in at levels anywhere near 60 um, as, the economy, um, as the economy continues to recover. I think potentially the delay to the reopening in June could well have affected or taken some of the sheen or the shine off the June services number per se. In any case, um, could have a quick look at DS Smith. They are reporting four year numbers on the 22nd. The packaging company um, saw a little bit of a reversal earlier this week. Is the packaging boom over? As people start to go out to the shops more, will the number of people who do online shopping start to decline? The shares are at record highs. Will the full year numbers, um, or the outlook for that matter, be slightly disappointing? So that could be interesting. Um, what did DS Smith have to say about the outlook? In the same token, FedEx, online logistics. Again, that chart looks as if it's breaking down towards the downside. Will there be any surprises in the FedEx numbers? And they are due out on the 24th. We've also got Nike on the 24th, fourth quarter numbers as well, four year numbers. So keep an eye on all of them. So I think that pretty much uh, brings me to the end of this week's weekly market update. Once again, I'd like to thank you for listening, bearing with me bearing with my ramblings and I wish you all a very nice weekend and speak to you all same time, same place next week. Thanks for listening.